teaching compound meter is a piece of cake. A little hard to believe maybe, but I'm hopeful that I can convince many of you that it's really true. I've been a music educator for over 60 years, 30 of them in the middle school, which is perhaps most often where teaching compound meter happens. So let's get started. Let's imagine that the students we will be looking at today are going to be introduced to compound meter for the very first time in our middle school music band, music room. We're talking maybe about sixth or seventh grade band orchestra or choir students. You and I and our imaginary students are going to walk through this introduction together. These students are already familiar and competent with music written in simple meters like 4-4 four, four, and 2-4 and probably cut time. Those meters seem to be universally the way beginners, both children and adults, are introduced to the reading of music. This past November's webinars that Carly was talking about, entitled Not Your Grandfather's Way of Teaching Rhythm, Parts 1 and 2, were all about simple time signatures where all the music was divided into halves and quarters and eighths and so forth, with counting like one and two e and a three and four. Um, today's webinar is all about compound meter. And because of time restrictions, I will not have anywhere near enough time to be able to share with you everything I would want to tell you about compound meter. It's a massive subject. I will tell you that part four of the textbook you see on your screen at this time devotes 50 pages to compound meter exclusively. It will go deeper into everything I talk about today, plus several things I don't even have time to mention. And so now on the compound meter is a piece of cake. If you're ready or not, here we go. At some point today, I will be talking about compound meter counting systems, and I want you to be forewarned. I am going to be brave or perhaps foolish. I will be telling you that I personally far prefer one particular system for counting compound meter over all others. And of course, I'll give you my reasons. I'm certain that some of you, perhaps many of you, will disagree with me, but that's okay. Most of us really love our own counting systems, don't we? Not to worry, no harm will be done to any music teachers or to their counting systems by you hearing what I have to say. But I do ask you to please at least consider my reasons for this one particular system for counting music written in compound meter. I admit I'm biased and I'm obviously not trying to hide it. My experience informs me that this particular counting system helps students to understand compound meter in maybe the easiest way you can imagine. My sixth grade instrumental students, whom only I only saw twice a week for a half an hour, could sight read three, four time in one beat to the bar. True waltz time with no confusion or hesitation because they completely understood compound meter. I could simply say to students when they were doing the three, four unit of their method book, Okay, let's sight read this next one in one beat to the bar. No frowning, no confusion. They just picked up their instruments and played something like do, 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 while looking at three, four time, quarter, 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 half, quarter, dotted half. How is that possible? We're going to be talking about that. Once students understand compound meter, they will not be asking you, how's this go? Instead, they will be saying to themselves, I can figure this out. And because that's their attitude, they actually can. The new revolutionary definition of the meanings of the top and bottom numbers of time signatures that we talked about in November obviously does not work at all for compound meter. But what about compound meter in which the beats are divided into thirds and the counting is triple it, triple it, or hamburger, hamburger, one lolly, two lolly, or whatever? Good question. Hopefully, you'll have an answer to this when we're done here today. We again have a choice. So many choices in life, aren't there? There is a difficult way to teach compound meter, and there is a very, very easy way. 
Whenever I have come to that particular fork in any road, I have always chosen the easy way, especially for my students. I am a devout, practical, practicing simpleton and proud of it. I'm sure you've heard of the KISS formula, keep it simple, stupid. If you and I ever meet someday at a music conference, a large room, and you see me way across the room, and you point and you yell, hey, there's David Newell, the simpleton. I will probably holler back, thank you. I've worked really hard at that. And remember, keep it simple, stupid. In my opinion, compound meter is one of the most confusing and difficult things we have to teach to not only young music students, but to adult music learners as well. And there are very good reasons for this confusion. Let's think about this for a couple of minutes. By its very nature, compound meter is confusing. Our basic rhythmic note symbols, the big five that I call the family of notes, whole, half, quarter, eighth, and sixteenth, their names and their mathematics are all based on division by twos. The whole note splits into two half notes, each half note splits into two quarter notes, and so on. In simple common 4-4 four, four time, I'm sure we can all agree that quarter notes are naturally and mathematically divided into half so that there are two eighth notes on a count. One and two and T, 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 and so on. But those who developed our system of rhythmic notation centuries ago realized that they had a real problem when it came to figuring out how to notate music that had the beats divided into thirds. How could they do that when the note symbols they had to use were named half notes, quarter notes, and eighth notes? Those are all divided into halves. We don't have third notes. Quarter notes in compound six eight are two thirds of a count, and we don't have two third note symbols either. And what would one third and two third notes even look like? They reasoned that they either had to one, come up with new note symbols, or two, they somehow had to use the only note symbols they had to work with, eighth notes and quarter notes, to represent the non existent one third notes and two third notes. I repeat, compound meter by its very nature from the get-go essentially is confusing. It is confusing, but it doesn't have to be. I'd much prefer come to your school or your studio and teach your students compound meter rather than 4-4 four, four any day. Compound meter is so easy to teach. It is literally a piece of cake and students love compound meter. So how do we make it's so easy for students to understand two things, the power of the dot and mother goose. Stay with me here and keep an open mind. Some genius unknown to me, but I use that term respectfully, several centuries ago solved the problem of having to create one third and two third note symbols in order to put into writing the sound of compound meter. And of course, the basic sound of compound meter, as I said, is the triplet, beats divided into three parts. 76 trombones led the big parade, with 110 cornets right behind. Such a wonderful, playful, rhythmic sound. No wonder kids love it. Thankfully, thankfully, no new note symbols were needed in order to notate those sounds. Everybody could stop trying to figure out what a one-third note and a two-third note should look like. I'm so glad they did. I think the big five, those note symbols that I call the family of notes, whole half, quarter, eights, and sixteenths, are plenty enough to deal with. This unknown genius figured out that they could use basic eighth notes and quarter notes with no little number three having to be written under or over those notes if they did just one simple thing. All that was needed was to make a dotted note, the kind of note that gets one count. So simple. Inside a basic whole note, pictured on the left side of this graphic you're looking at, inside of each of those live two whole notes. But inside a dotted whole note on the right-hand side, there live three half notes. I'm sorry, inside the whole note live two half notes. But inside the dotted whole note on the right side, there live three half notes. I'm sure you've heard the following many times. A dot after a note adds half the value of the note to the note. What a verbal maze that is. And we expect young minds to find their way through that word jungle. 
I once heard a teacher who was explaining to young students the importance of the dotted quarter note in compound 6-8, and it really is important. He used lots and lots of words, but he avoided that verbal maze by saying at the end of his explanation of compound 6-8. And so you see, the quarter note is now 150%. Huh? To young students? I don't know about that. <laughs> Take a last look at the graphic as I say something that I believe is absolutely true. A picture is worth a thousand words. I'm convinced that this graphic should be hanging in a much enlarged form in every music room across the globe all year long. This one picture clearly shows students the very foundation of rhythmic notation. That's it in a picture. Inside a basic half note, there live two quarter notes. But inside a dotted half note, there live three quarter notes. Inside a basic quarter note, there live two eighth notes. Inside a dotted quarter note, there live three eighth notes. So much easier to understand than a dot after note adds half of the to the note. Um, picture in this essence time is worth more than a thousand words. And it's very accurate. Many of us, Many of us have used thousands of words to try to help students understand compound meter. And there it is in one simple picture. And drum roll, please. That wasn't a drum roll, Mr. Noel. That was a trumpet flutter tongue. I know. I haven't lost it yet, folks. If the dotted quarter note is designated as a note that gets one full count in a piece of music, then the three eighth notes that live inside that one count dotted quarter note will each have to be one third of a count, with no little number three having to be written. Those through eighth note, those three eighth notes are what I have come to call natural triplets. I may very well have coined the term natural triplets. I've not heard it or read it anywhere. Natural triplets are not exceptions like the triplets in common time are. They are the natural division of the one count dotted note. And because they are not exceptions, no little number three has to be written under or over them. Problem number one solved, the power of the dot, natural triplets. Thankfully, we don't need little we need, don't need one third notes. And more thankfully, we don't have to put a little three under or over all the figures that are triplets in compound meter. Could you imagine a Sousa march with a little number three under or over every triplet figure? Can you imagine that? I'm not sure we could even see the notes for all the little number threes cluttering up the page. All we need to do is make a dotted quarter note, the kind of note that gets one beat, and the three eighth notes that live inside that dotted quarter note have to be triplets. They are three equal notes, equally spaced over one beat. Students can easily see this and understand it. Like I said, a genius solution to a significant problem. So when I use the term compound meter, I am referring to music whose beats are divided into thirds and sixths and twelfths. It's music whose counting words are like one lolly, two lolly, or triple it, triple it, hamburger, hamburger, and so forth. My first attempt at teaching her compound six eight march did not go very well at all. There's a good reason for that. I need to tell you something. I had no idea how to teach compound meter. If you ever meet any of my old students, please don't tell them that. I'm sure they all know it already. Just don't remind them. Thank you. At that time, fairly early in my years of teaching, my school was not a middle school. It was a seven, eight, nine junior high school. And the band was by audition only. So I had some really fine players. I had been feeling that because I was a band director, I should introduce these students to John Philip Sousa, the March King. And I certainly felt that I had to teach them compound meter. I absolutely did not want to send them to the high school with no idea of compound meter. I mean, what would that high school director think of this new rookie music teacher? So I found a really nice Susan March named the Black Horse Troop. I felt certain that the students had the technique to handle the piece. And I felt that I could, with this one march, fill two personal goals of mine. One, introduce my students to John Philip Sousa, and two, teach them compound meter. 
what a lucky find that march was. Before I started the march, I knew for sure that I could not teach it in six beats to the bar. All my students had at one time or another completed the six, eight unit of the method book we had at the time, a method book which I did not choose, I inherited when I got my first job. And the teaching those six, eight in six beats to the measure did not work at all, so far as I was concerned. The entire unit was presented in simple six, eight in the book, a six, eight that some people call slow six, eight. There were literally six counts in a measure and eighth notes for one count just like the time signature says. Quarter notes were two counts and so on. My students didn't like that at all. First of all, they were convinced, of course, that quarter notes are one count. What kind of an idiot wrote music in which quarter notes are two counts? I imagine that's what some of them were thinking. They had learned that quarter notes are one count in music class in probably second grade. And they had stashed that fact in a lockbox in their memory banks. But they were patient and persevered and eventually accepted two count quarter notes. But they discovered that after all the exercises were completed in the unit, and when they finally got to do the six, eight songs at the end of the unit, the songs sounded stupid. Over the river and through the woods, to grandmother's house we go. Kind of a bumpy ride, wouldn't you say? It was rhythmically and mathematically correct, but it was musically ridiculous and wrong. They were giving every eighth note equal emphasis. They knew it sounded stupid and so did I, but I didn't quite know what to do about it. My solution was to play the songs faster and they became more ridiculous, especially for the foot tappers. So of course I had them tap only on counts one and four. And how much sense does that make to young students trying to understand all this? You call it count four, but it's beat two? Yes, boys and girls, there are six counts, but only two beats in a measure. And I'm sure they were thinking, okay, if you say so, teacher. And then, of course, a little later, I realized that we also had to talk about the differences between beats and counts. Beats are musical. They are the unwritten things that make us want to tap our feet or sway from side to side when we hear a song in compound meter but counts are mathematical. A musical accountant, if there were such a thing, could examine the Black Horse Troop for us and verify that for, in fact, in every measure, there is the value of six eighth notes in every measure. Later on, that could help the students understand the meanings of the numbers in a compound six eight time signature. There are the equivalent of six eighth notes in every measure. That is what the time signature is telling you in compound six, eight. That's later, if you want to do it in six. Back to over the river. Obviously, the song had to be over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. Musically, it had to be in two beats per measure. And so, Seuss's Black Horse Troop would be taught in two beats to the measure. I wished myself good luck, buddy. I mounted one of those black horses and charged onto the battlefield, although I was not very well armed for the impending battle. So we started slogging our way through the black horse troop. Slogging our way is the most accurate description I could give you. Things started out well enough. That's because there was a four bar intro that was unison which I taught by singing to them over and over. I thought the intro would get them into the spirit of the march, and it did. And that's where the trouble started. The first strain looked too hard, all kinds of different rhythms going on at the same time. So I skipped that without even trying it and went to the trio. The trio was in a more familiar key and fairly easy and playable. After we learned both the introduction and the trio, I then went back and tackled the first strain. And that's the way it went. Every rehearsal, every day for a very, very long time. We literally just butchered that Susan March, cutting it into little pieces and chewing on them until they were somewhat tender. The results of that brilliant strategy, the students learned to dislike the music of John Philip Sousa. We had to rehearse it every single day without fail. We eventually played it on a concert and it was sort of okay. 
But I was determined that that would not happen again, never again. And here is what convinced me. After the concert, which was the final concert of the school year, I assumed that the students had learned compound meter. After all, that's what I had taught them, right? So I handed out an easier piece in compound 6-8 just to finish off the year. I think some of you are probably already ahead of me here. The students could hardly begin to play the other march. Here, I thought they had learned compound meter. Essentially, all they had learned was their individual parts to that one march for that one concert. They apparently had learned almost nothing about compound meter. They had just learned a piece of music written in compound meter by way of constant, monotonous, rote-like repetition. They had learned to not like Sousa. They had learned almost nothing about compound meter, and I had learned how not to teach compound meter. Abundant amounts of not learning had occurred. In my view, a complete failure. It was quite a few years before I tried teaching compound meter again. As a matter of fact, by that time, we were no longer a 789 junior high school. We were in the same building, but it was now a 678 middle school. So I had the opportunity to introduce compound meter to younger students, and I was pretty confident that it would be successful. I had given my failure a great deal of thought, and I was ready to give compound meter another go round. And as it turned out, it truly was actually easy as a piece of cake. At the start of that next school year, I seriously changed the structure of my rehearsals, and I never went back. Every rehearsal was structured in a two-part format. The first part of every rehearsal was the lesson part, and the second part of every rehearsal was the literature part. In the lesson part, I taught a complete and thorough unit of study on the basic principles of compound meter for as long as it took in a rehearsal and for as many weeks as it took to accomplish. I started that journey well in advance of the concert. I was not in a hurry. My, my goals were to have the students master not only the science of compound meter, but also the performance of it. This was done while a different and new 6-8 March was sitting on my desk. I did not hand out that piece until I had assured myself that the students really knew compound meter. They could play it musically, they could count it, and they could sight read it in unison etudes. And very importantly, they had passed a written test that included rhythmic dictation in compound 6-8. Rhythmic dictation in young band students? Absolutely. It is it is the only way that teachers can know for certain that students truly understand it. There is no law that says rhythmic dictation is just for college and university music majors. Young students can and should do rhythmic dictation from a very early age. How to introduce rhythmic dictation to very young students is discussed in the teaching rhythm text that you just saw, by the way. I don't have time for that today. Very important, the unit of study that I started at the beginning of that school year was not the kind that features 90% teacher explanation lecture, talk, 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 blah, blah, blah. We all talk too much. This unit of study was just the opposite. 10% teacher talk and 90% students doing compound meter every class a great deal of unison playing every day. By the way, as Carly told you, tomorrow night I'm doing a session called The Power of Unison. Same time, same station. The rhythm learning sequence, how to teach a new rhythm to students. Step one, perform it first and stay on that step until it is mastered. No explanations, just do it. Step two, count it until that is mastered. Step three, see it for the very first time. This third step, take a little detour here. This third step is the first step that many of us start with when introducing a new rhythm. And it is a huge mistake in my view. We tend to say to students, look, 
top of page 17 of your books, we have a new rhythm. When we say, look, we are introducing music as though it is a visual art, something to see. They're not looking at music, they're looking at music notation. Music is an aural art, something to hear. Students can certainly look at the new rhythm, but they have no idea what it sounds like. And of course, because we have them looking at the new rhythm, we start to explain it. And the students have no idea what we're talking about. Most of them just turn us off at that point. They know we'll sing it for them when we get desperate. The first word out of our mouths when introducing a new rhythm should not be look. It should be another word that starts with the letter L. It should be listen. Step four in the five-step rhythm learning sequence is test it. How? Method book etudes, songs, teacher-made exercises by way of notation software, and rhythmic dictation. Step five, the last step in the sequence, understand it. These five steps in that exact order are introduced and taught before the students ever see the piece of music and compound meter that is sitting on our desk. Once again, the steps are perform it, count it, see it, test it, and understand it in that exact order. We will now take our imaginary students through these five steps, one at a time, for the first several minutes of every rehearsal. So on the first day of the new unit of study, which is on compound meter, we will simply have the students perform the rhythm, nothing else. No explanations of any sort, just do it. Thanks again, Nike, for one of the best corporate slogans of all time. Nike's corporate slogan, just do it. Don't explain it, just do it. So today is the day that we introduce our students to their very first lesson in our compound meter unit of study. The new 6-8 piece is on our desks where it will stay until our students have done all five steps and have mastered compound meter. We will be concentrating on one thing at a time before we move on to the next step in the sequence. This will be done for a few minutes every class for however long it takes, weeks, months, who knows. If it is mastered now, it will never have to be taught again, ever. So we're not in a hurry. The time taken now will save tons of time later. Our goal is to have the students sight read the piece of music that is on our desks. We are simply giving them the skills they will need in order to do that. That makes a lot of sense to me. So here's how we begin, having students perform a rhythm they know nothing about. Class, I'm gonna start chanting something. I want you to join me as soon as you know what I'm saying. See if you can be the first person in your row to join me. Here I go, join me. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. And we'd probably do it again. On other days, we'd do Little Bo Peep and Hickory Dickory Dock and the Ainsy Weensy Spider went up the water spout. That one we'd sing. Humpty Dumpty sat on the mall and on and on and on. There are many, many compound meter nursery rhymes. If our students don't know these old English nursery rhymes, they will learn them because we'll be doing them day after day for a very few minutes and they are not that hard to learn. Curriculum integration again. We're using both math and social studies to teach music. The history of nursery rhymes, by the way, is pretty interesting. After we're sure that everybody knows Jack and Jill, we will sing it up a scale. For the first time, it has to be modeled in order for them to know when to change pitches. And so I say, watch me, I'm going to sing Jack and Jill up the scale, and here's what we do. Jack and Jill went up the scale to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Kerwin hand signs and band, absolutely, I found it to be a wonderful source. On the day, we are certain that they all know the Jack and Jill rhyme. We have them play it up the concert B flat scale. Kids, if you forget the rhythm, just think of the words. Strings would play it on the D major scale, choirs and piano players on the C major scale, all white keys for your little piano 
students. Why these particular scales? Because these scales have been known for a long time by the students. They allow students to concentrate on only one thing, and that is the sound of the new rhythm. In our band today are instructions to the percussion. Snares and mallets play the rhyme. The sticking is like your feet would move and work if you were skipping down a sidewalk. What would we see in here? Right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, till down and broke his crown and Joe came tumbling right, left. That, of course, is rudimental, rudimental snare sticking for compound six eight, quarter eighth, quarter eighth rhythm. Haskell Har would be so proud of you. Mr. Bass Drummer, you are a man of few words. You're just going to hit the highlights. Jack, Jill, up. Hill, fetch, pale, water, and so forth. And then we'd put it all together. And the entire band is going to be performing the most perfect, lilting, compound 6 8 without a word of confusing explanation. No talk of one third count notes, two third count notes, no talk of six beats in a measure, which is absolutely not true. They're just doing compound 6 8. Why do I say teaching compound meter is a piece of cake? Because we don't have to teach it. Our students can already do it. That's what makes it so easy. Our students learned it long before we ever met them. All we have to do is harvest their experience. The international taunt of childhood is two measures of compound 6-8. Nah, 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 nah. Not bad, huh? When a child skips, their whole body is doing compound meter. Compound meter is the rhythm of childhood. It is the experience of childhood. And it's just sitting there waiting for us to put it to good use. No confusing long-winded explanations are necessary. At this point, explanations would do far more harm than good. Step one is perform it. Just do it, nothing else. And by the way, thank you, Mother Goose. Once students are performing compound meter sounds expressively and musically, step one has been mastered. The foundation has been laid for step two, count it. This rhythm learning sequence is a process of piling success upon success upon success. Without this foundation, we've just built the whole structure would collapse. Before we delve into the concepts of step two, count it. I told you a while ago that I would be expressing my strong preference for a certain counting system for compound meter. I realize that most teachers are really loyal to their own counting systems, just like I am. But I do hope that you will at least listen to my reasons for, suggest, for suggesting that you give this particular counting system some thought. Feel free to ignore it after you've thought about it. I really like one triplet, two triplet counting system because triplet sounds are the very foundation of compound meter. It's why we have compound meter. So every time students do any counting in compound meter, they will be saying some form of the word triplet. Compound meter is not all about that bass, that bass. It's all about them triplets, them triplets. One final thing, and then we'll get back to our middle school band and step two of the rhythm learning sequence, which is count it. How do you count sixteenths in compound six eight? I believe I developed a unique counting system for that particular problem. At least I've never seen it written or talked about anywhere except in that textbook of mine. And I do do a lot of reading about rhythm. Counting sixteenths is probably the strongest reason I have for choosing one triplet, two triplet as the foundation for counting compound meter. This Counting system gives students a firm foundation for later understanding the science of compound meter. And you did notice, I hope, that understanding is the fifth and final step in this rhythm learning sequence. So let me tell you a story from my past. <clears throat> old men do like to seem, seem to like telling stories, don't they? It's like I was your old grandpa telling you a story. I was observing 
a really fine high school band once and the upper woodwinds were having a lot of difficulty with an extended number of measures full of very fast 16th note passages in a compound meter march. They were fine players and fingerings were not the problem at all. They were just having trouble finding the beats, knowing where the notes needed to be on the beats and which notes needed to be there. They just weren't hearing it right. So the director did the usual. He stopped the rehearsal and told the upper woodwinds to count the 16th notes aloud. He set the same fast tempo and had them count. One and two and three and four and six and one and two and three and four and six and one and two and... Suddenly all of those counting aloud in front of their classmates developed coughing fits. They turned their heads to the side and covered their mouths to cough. <laughs> I was standing behind the group and I could clearly see they weren't coughing at all. They were laughing. Why did they turn their heads? Because in that ensemble, you did not laugh if the director wasn't laughing. You know what I mean? So how to count 16th notes in compound 6-8 at any tempo if the eighth notes are counted one triplet, two triplet? Students must know that any basic eighth note in any time signature naturally splits into two sixteenths. So if the first eighth note in a group of three compound eighth notes is split into two sixteenths, the students simply add the syllable uh, the same sound as in one e and uh, for any eighth note that is split in half. If the first eighth note is split into two sixteenths instead of one triplet, two triplet, it's one a triplet, two a triplet, da -ka -da 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 -ka -da -da. the middle eighth note split, it's one triple that, two triple that, one da -ka -da 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 -ka -da. the third eighth note split into sixteenths, one triplet, a two triplet, a one triplet, a two. First and second eighth notes split into two sixteenths. Instead of one triplet, two triplet, it's one a triplet, two a triplet, da 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 Second and third eighth notes split. Instead of one triplet, two triplet, it's one triplet, a two triplet, a da 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 And if all the eighth notes are split into measure after measure of sixteenth notes, like that wonderful band was having problem with, it's one triplet, two triplet, one a triplet, two a 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 triplet, one. I don't believe any of you can say one and two and three and four and five and six and anywhere near fast enough, fast enough for students to actually hear how the sixteen notes are going to sound when they play them. One a triplet, two a triplet. In addition to me, counting compound meter in six. But conducting it in two is putting another layer of confusion on students' compound plates. The thing I like the best about this is the fact that when counting sixteenths in compound meter, by what they're saying, the students are reinforcing the concept that compound meter is all about triplets. And by the way, I don't mind saying that I'm rather proud of this 16th note counting innovation. I do wish it would catch on but it can't catch on if people don't know about it. Maybe you could help me spread the word. I'd appreciate it. Now let's get back to our middle school band. They have mastered step one with the help of Mother Goose, Jack and Jill, and Humpty Dumpty, and Little Bo Peep, and the Eensy Weensy Spider, and a mouse that runs up and down clocks all the time, must be obsessive compulsive, plus, plus other nefarious characters. In step two of the rhythm learning sequence, students need to know and need to learn the counting names we associate with these particular sounds. How to do that? Very, very simply. Echo me exactly. Hickory dickory dock. And they say hickory dickory dock. Then we say, one triplet, two triplet, one. And they say, one triplet, two triplet, one. And then you say, Jack and Jill went up the hill. And then we say, one, one let two, let one let two. With no explanation, students are learning their teacher's counting words for these rhythmic sounds, the same way they learned to say the words for the things they found in their environments when they were very, very young, just learning to talk by imitating their parents' words. Kitty, doggy, mommy, daddy, night, night. And when they got a little older and they didn't want to go to bed, they started composing their own little sentences. No, night, night, no, night, night. 
This is all done with no words of explanation, no words of wisdom from the adults in the room, no talk of nouns and verbs and adjectives for the toddlers. Obviously, they wouldn't understand them. And no talk of fractions for our young rhythm learners. Imitation is Mother Nature's language learning system. That's undoubtedly why this works so well, as our students are introduced to our counting language for compound meter. When the time is right, we will need to assess whether or not our students have mastered step two, count it. This assessment will tell us if it's time to move on to step three. We tell them one day that we are going to speak a rhythm in neutral syllables, and they must respond immediately with the correct counting words. For instance, kids, if I say, do, 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 you must count immediately on the very next beat, one triplet, two triplet, one let two. It's time for step three when they can do that. We are essentially going to be saying to our students, this is the look of that thing you can already do. One thing to concentrate on, what a familiar, already known sound looks like on a piece of paper. How do we do that? As simply as possible. Remember, I'm a simpleton. One day we say to our students, spoken in compound meter, how would you like to see what Humpty Dumpty looks like? At that point, we would raise a flashcard or we'd flash the notation on our classroom electronic screen with the notation showing. And we would say, Humpty Dumpty looks like one, let two, let one, two. Remember, they've just mastered these counting words. The only new thing to concentrate on is what the rhythm looks like in notation. This kind of work continues every day until mastered. Hickory dickory looks like this. One triplet, two triplet, one let two. The students are doing all the thinking and learning. Step four, test it. How? Sight reading unison etudes from either a method book or teacher generated etudes using notation software. And finally, rhythmic dictation of the now learned basics of compound six eight. Once students are successfully sight reading etudes in compound meter, it is time to tell them what they've been doing. You have been playing in what musicians call compound meter. Did you think that was hard? They would usually say, huh? Well, let me tell you something. Many, many students in your age think that instead of it being called compound meter, it should have been called confusing meter. But you know better, right? We are building self-esteem here, people. Step five of the rhythm learning sequence, how do you teach students to understand the theoretical basis of compound meter? Simple which I'm convinced is why it really works. We talked earlier this hour, this hour about dotted notes having three notes living inside each of them. It is now time for you to show and tell your students about that. In other words, it's teacher show and tell day. In order for them to understand the science of compound meter, students need to understand dotted notes. And so it's step five, which is named understand it, we say this to them, kids, you all know the family of notes. I'm sure you can say this in your sleep, whole half quarter, eight sixteenth. Well, guess what? There's another family of notes that is extremely closely related to the one you know so well. This new family of notes is known as the family of dotted notes. Instead of just plain old whole half quarter, eight sixteenth, it's dotted whole, dotted half, dotted eighth, dotted sixteenth, dotted eighth and dotted sixteenth. It's our basic family of notes with a dot after each note. Look at the chart at the front of the room, which I hope is there. As they can clearly see inside every dotted note, there live three notes. Inside a dotted whole note, there live three half notes. Inside a dotted half, there live three quarter notes. Inside a dotted quarter, there live three eighth notes. And when a composer indicates, or your teacher says, for instance, that the dotted quarter note gets one beat, then the three eighth notes that live inside that dotted quarter note have to add up to one beat. That's why we've been counting the eighth notes, one triplet, two triplet. As you can see, three eighth notes is the natural division of the dotted quarter note. These eighth notes are what we call natural triplets. Students who have been previously introduced to triplets in simple time signatures think the triplet sounds have to be noted, notated with a little three written under or over the notes. They must understand why the triplet sounds in compound meter do not need that. 
I would be embarrassed to tell you how old I was before I figured that out. Remember, only when students understand will they be able to solve their own problems. And finally, we teach them that the way they can know if a piece is in compound meter is easy. It's a piece of cake. If a dotted note is the kind of note that gets one beat, you are in compound meter, and the three eighth notes that live inside those dotted notes in the piece are natural triplets, no little number three required. Because my sixth graders knew that when I said that a three four etude would be read in one beat to the bar, they knew that the three quarter notes in the measures were natural triplets. How did they know that? They knew that inside every dotted half note, there are three quarter notes. And if the dotted half gets one beat, they are in compound meter, and the three quarter notes were natural triplets, no little number three needed, and the counting was one triplet, one triplet kind of stuff. And yes, we chanted that aloud, and obviously in compound meter sounds. How did they know that it was one triplet, one triplet? They were so accustomed to saying one triplet, two triplet. They knew that a full measure in any piece of music starts with count one. When they crossed that bar line after the first three quarter notes, they knew that the next counting word was one. And they also learned that my conducting baton made essentially the same straight up and down mark of a bar line. If they got lost in a piece of music, there was no sense in crying over spilt notes. Just look up and the baton will show you where the next measure starts. Just join us again. I think that I'm out of time, almost. Um, my units of study, I will, I will finish with this. My units of study were based on the kinds of studies that math teachers use. They do a unit of study on the multiplication of fractions, and then they give the quiz or a test on that one thing. And the next unit of study might be on the division of fractions, allowing the students to discover the things that are alike and those that are different between the two related math functions. In music, we tend not to do that, unfortunately. We hand out a piece of music and end up teaching an articulation here, a style there, a different articulation over there to another group of students, a rhythm here, a rhythm there, everywhere a rhythm rhythm. And that ends the sermon for tonight. Thank you so much. Hope to see you tomorrow. You're on, Carly. All right. Thank you, David, for such a wonderful presentation. I hope You're you welcome. all have enjoyed our time here with David. Um, again, at CHOS, we are offering a special promotion on select David Newell publications following this presentation. I am putting that information into the chat now. The promo code is going to be Newell22. And you can use that on our website for 25% off of select David Newell publications. Feel free to do that at any point in the next week or so. It should be running for a while. Thank you again, David, for this wonderful presentation. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or in the Q&A function, and we can pose them now. Currently, we don't seem to have any, which is OK, because we've had a wonderful presentation. I'm sure everybody's been enthralled. <laughs> If they email Chose, yes, uh, if, um, if you Chose will and have a question or a comment, Chose will forward the email to me and I'd be happy to answer. Of course, absolutely. I've included the Chose contact email twice as well. You can Good. email that for your packet information if you send us your preferred shipping. And also, if you have any questions directly for David, we can send that to him personally, no problem at all. And I'm sure he'll get back to you, or we can if it's a question regarding any publication questions. All right. We've had a comment thanking you, and they love the one triplet, two triplet tips. Oh, yay! <laughs> one triplet, right. you need to practice that one triplet, two triplet. <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> um, we do have one question for you here. Yes. Uh, so when passing out a piece in compound meter, do you tell them that the dotted note equals one? By that time, after I, after I, uh, when I've handed it out, they should know that. That's been mass, they, they know that. And they've seen all kinds of notation, uh, which I didn't have time to show you. you know. um, 
hickory dickory looks like, they see dotted quarter notes, hickory dickory looks like, et cetera. So you prep them on the visual notation before handing out a piece? Oh yeah, that's step three, see it. Perfect. Yeah. I just had to go so fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, don't be sorry. It was perfect. Wonderful. No, it wasn't. If anybody has anything else, feel free to send us an email or post it in the chat. People enjoyed using the nursery rhymes as well. I like that too. That's a new thing that I haven't had happen with my teaching of rhythm. So that would be fun. You know, if I have another one minute, if anybody's listening, I'm a slow, thorough learner. While I was preparing this seminar, after all the years of doing these nursery rhymes, I just realized so many of them are eight measures long of compound six eight. Jack and Joe went up the hill to fetch pail of water, jackal down brook from duck and da -da. So it's perfect for playing on and singing on a major scale. I just never realized that. That's the so nursery smart. rhymes are eight measures of compound meter, and the rhymes are eight. It's perfect. That's great. It works perfectly. Yeah. And that gives some students something on which they can perform the, the rhythm. You know, to perform Jack and Jill on contradaff, boring. <laughs> you know, but you, you know, how many songs start on do? Many. How many songs end on do? Many. So it's almost like a song. And the melody is not entrancing, but it is a melody for that first step, which is performant. <clears throat> That's a great tip. I like it. I like the little tidbit. <laughs> well, uh, again, that promo code is usable at our website and you can feel free to send us an email at email at chess.com at any point. If you have questions about accessing past, uh, past presentations by David, accessing this presentation in the future, attending tomorrow, or using any discount codes that we've sent out, feel free to contact us. We can also get in touch with David for you. Um, thank you all for joining us today. It's been wonderful having you. David, thank you for this a a wonderful presentation. It was so great to have you as well. Um, I, think we, I think we are.